Awesome. I hope everyone's doing well and um, thank you all for joining us today. I'm sure you're excited for this. Um, so this is a discussion, if you're still like not sure, um, it's going to be between um, Dr. Dan Bonet and Dr. Robert Drost, um, Head of Research at Consensus. Uh, I'm Priyanka. I'm your host um, today. A quick introduction about myself. Uh, I am a master's student with the electrical engineering department. I also am the president for the blockchain club here at Stanford. Um, we have a governance um, research team where we also do governance accelerator and an education department, um, part of which we are doing these sessions to pretty much just share the word about what's happening in the space at the moment and just um, encouraging more folks to join us as we go down the rabbit hole. and. Um, if you want to know about this event or um, future events recording for this event, I'll just drop all the links in the description um, in the chat box below so you guys can like um, take a look at it and let me know if you need any help. Um, the format of this event is going to be 50 minutes discussion and 25 minutes of open floor Q&A. Um, just a humble a request is that um, this discussion is on the merge. so. Let's keep questions pertinent to the technicalities of merge and um, Ethereum. Um, yeah, so off to Dr. Dan to take it off. Perfect. Thank you so much, Priyanka. So the goal is we're, we're going to talk until 540 and then we'll open it up for questions. Does that sound about right? Yeah, sounds perfect. Perfect. Okay, so uh, all of you guys, while we are speaking, please write questions in the chat. And we'll come back to them at uh, at 5:40, and then we can even unmute folks, and uh, uh, people can ask questions um, in person. Uh, I guess before we get started, I did want to make one announcement. You probably got, you probably all know that we are running this uh, Science of Blockchain conference. It used to be called Stanford Blockchain Conference, but we kept the S, and we renamed it the Science of Blockchain Conference. Um, it's going to be at the end of the month. And one thing that I wanted to mention is that on Tuesday, just before lunch, we're going to have a lightning talks session. So anyone who has an interesting project or anyone who has like um, job openings is very welcome to come up to the mic, speak for two to three minutes. You can tell us what your project is about, what your research is about for two to three minutes. We'll try to get through as many people as we can. And it's a great opportunity for everyone to participate. So I, I really look forward to seeing you there. Those are these lightning talk sessions are always a lot of fun. Okay, so let's get back to the to our main event. So today we are actually thrilled to ho host uh, Robert uh, Drost. So thank you so much for uh, joining us, Robert. I'm really, really looking forward to the conversation. So Robert is the head of R&D Consensus. Maybe I can say a few words about your bio, Robert, so, so folks know who you are. Yes, yeah, let's see. So uh, Robert, in his early career, worked at Sun Microsystems as um, on the products and research in the products and research divisions. Then he, uh, I guess while he was at uh, Sun, which is very impressive, he also earned his PhD from Stanford in double E in computer science. Um, he also co-founded a startup. And then he uh, joined Consensus as, um, as their head of, head of R&D. I should also, maybe I can embarrass you a little bit, Robert, and I can say that uh, Robert was named as um, MIT's, one of MIT's technology review TR100, which is 100 in innovators uh, under the age of 35 to watch to watch for. He also won the Wall Street Journal Gold Medal for Innovation. So, uh, Robert, it's wonderful to have you here, and I'm really, really looking forward to the conversation. Thanks so much for joining us. So, so today we're going to talk about Ethereum, and the, particularly the Ethereum merge, which is kind of a big event that we've been waiting for for many years, and it's actually upon us. Hopefully, this will happen in September. So just to make sure everybody is on the same page, Robert, could you kind of walk us through what the merge is about and why is it such a big deal? What are the implications and so on? So yeah, let's let's hear about it. Yeah, and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just always pleased. Dan, Dan Bonet has done obviously so much for the field of cryptography and uh, just really appreciate all of the work you've done in blockchain as well. Um, I think, you know, for people going through school now, it's Maybe hard to kind of recognize, but there was a long period of time before blockchain came along where a lot of technologies were just sort of incrementally, I feel like, improving. And there's been such a tremendous uh, explosion of the ability to actually incorporate cryptography and distributed systems now that it's, you know, once again, to me, pretty much as exciting as things were in, you know, early 90s of, you know, of computers where we were just going from an unconnected world to a connected world. Now we're going to one that captures so many more things. So it's great to be here. 
And um, yeah, Ethereum, Ethereum is, uh, you know, been going on to this process of trying to get to this uh, Ethereum 2. It's always been the plan to get here um, from the very first white paper and the original description. Proof of work was always meant for Ethereum to be just a stopgap. And that's an important point because a lot of people have kind of pointed out that, you know, with proof of work going away, um, there's a huge change in the economics of who benefits, uh, how do we protect the chain, huge security implications, you know, all sorts of things change. But it's not something that was sprung on the protocol. Um, it's something people have known for a long time. It's just moved back over time. I think the original thought was it would take about a year or two to get to proof of stake, which would have put it in the time frame of like late 2016, 2017. And, um, you know, by 2018, 2019, it was clear that all of the original ideas for how to do it uh, needed to be changed. And there was a huge revamp and so forth. So, you know, we finally got ourselves to this point where we went on this much more tractable approach that we're going to now. Um, I think the most uh, useful thing is a place to start with the merge. And I apologize, I know some of the people on this call are going to probably be incredibly deep technically and just I'll be talking about things that are, you know, too basic. And so people feel free if, uh, you know, if we need to, up, you know, uh, uh, go, you know, farther down or likewise, just uh, give us a little bit of a heads up. But I think one of the most useful things to point out is, you know, the reason it went from being an Ethereum 1 to an Ethereum 2 transition to just being called the merge was that um, uh, it was finally decided that it would be much better for Ethereum 2 to adopt and use the exact same execution machine that was used in Ethereum 1. And, you know, it shouldn't be taken now looking at the fact that we're, you know, a month or so away from the merge at this point that that was always a, you know, a, a assumed thing. Um, it was thought at one point it was going to be an execution system of 1,024 execution threads, each of them running a WASM process. It was going to be extremely fantastic with load balancing and asynchronous cross threaded communication and, you know, semaphore locks. You can imagine the distributed system would have been. Um, but over time, it was determined that, you know, in some sense, the success of Ethereum and the desire to stay maximally decentralized, it looked like it was actually possible to do something that a couple of years ago looked quite unthinkable, which was to take this virtual machine that was originally designed by Vitalik uh, Buterin and uh, Gavin Woods and a number of other people back in 2015, the EVM, which just stands for the Ethereum Virtual Machine, and to just continue to use it. And that is a pretty astonishing thing when you think about, you know, just the fact that the EVM is so non-performant. Um, it takes a lot of memory to run it. Uh, it has a huge amount of state. Um, it doesn't allow parallelization of instructions. It's possible that any given instruction is going to completely trash the state of every other contract that's about to execute. So you really have to execute it in this very serial fashion. There's, there's so many reasons that me and, you know, anybody who has background on like the instruction set architecture chip side would say that's, you know, a surprising result to be moving forward on it. Um, but the thing that's been really quite helpful is we've learned in Ethereum that we can, in fact, you know, keep this execution uh, virtual machine running as the same simple thing and we can do all of the scaling in other ways. And that's given us the fantastic ability for us to move to this idea of just merging. So we're just taking the EVM, which exists in the current proof of work clients, everybody's running it and they wrap it around this proof of work protocol where all of the people doing the hashes for Ethereum one, they're doing these SHA-3 hashes in order to try to, you know, mint the next block around the world. And they get consensus on, you know, these EVM blocks. And when the merge happens, all that's going to happen is the EVM at that particular block height um, is going to instead be copied over into an EVM running now, no longer inside of the proof of work clients, but now inside of these, you know, tens and hundreds of thousands of Ethereum 2 validators that are running a completely different consensus protocol one that's had just massive amount of change in crypto economics and just overall economics and participant uh, security and environmental situation and so forth. 
But for the rest, all of us who are using Ethereum as a layer one protocol, we're running smart contracts, we're running data, um, we will see that the EVM has not changed. It's the same EVM we've always known and loved. It's just being run by a different chain. So, I mean, it's it looks entirely smooth from that perspective. I should point out there are some interesting implications of this. One of them is that, you know, there is not necessarily that the proof of work chain is ending. The uh, EVM that's getting copied over at a certain height gets copied into the Ethereum beacon chain, which has been running for quite some time now. And then the beacon chain now will have these EVM executions. And beyond that block height, it will be an EVM running inside of the proof of uh, state consensus algorithm. The old one in the old system doesn't necessarily die right away. And there's questions because effectively it looks almost like a fork where you go through this proof of work continues on and proof of stake has forked off of it. But the reason why around the world people consider this to be a very smooth process is everybody out there, Coinbase, Gemini, all of the DeFi protocols, all of the stable coins, they're all expected at that block height to switch over and say all of the funds that we have that's backing the stable coins all of the actual fiat currency sitting on exchanges and other things will all point to the new proof of stake chain. And so that's why effectively it looks like a smooth upgrade. Actually, it's beyond that, right? I mean, the, even if the proof of work chain continues to operate, it's not gonna be allowed to be called Ethereum. It will be, well, no one can stop it from being called Ethereum in the sense that there's no trademark that says people can't do it. And recently there has been a proposal. Finally, somebody went ahead and dropped a proposal and said, well, for us proof of work miners, you know, we might not want to stop it. And they said uh, they proposed that some people on that side would actually continue on. Um, they would propose that exchanges and others consider that their chain would be ETHW, standing for ETH proof of work. And so there, you know, there is some chance that there will be something going on. Passworks for things like Bitcoin with Bitcoin Cash and for Ethereum with Ethereum Classic. Um, for people who don't, you know, know the early history of Ethereum, the Ethereum we use today is actually a fork of the original Ethereum. There was a hack a long time back um, that divided the community in the sense that Vitalik decided to roll back the hack and other people thought it shouldn't have been. So there's actually a chain out there called Ethereum Classic that's been running this entire time since the beginning. And, uh, you know, it exists, it continues on. It's about, I think, a hundredth the value of the Ethereum chain. but. One of the interesting things in decentralization is no one can force you to use it. You can fork it anytime you want. It may not be worth anything, but you can fork it. And no one can also cause you to stop running it. That's the point of decentralization. So, But there was broad consensus that the Ethereum 2 that is going to become the main Ethereum is accepted by virtually everyone in the ecosystem as the correct fork that will be going on past the uh, past the uh, merge date. So, so that's going to be a proof of stake system. So we'll talk about uh, proof of stake in just a second. But uh, let me ask you, first of all, um, um, can you say like, why is this happening? Like, uh, what, why was it so important to do this merge? Why was it so important to move from proof of work to proof of stake? What was wrong with the existing way that Ethereum worked? Yeah, I mean, I think um, there definitely was the belief um, uh, from the early people that while something like proof of work is very effective from a mathematician or kind of a protocol point of view, you can see the issue with it is that, and already this was known by 2015 timeframe, that as the system becomes more successful back then things were worth, you know, sub billion, you know, small amounts of money. So it wasn't that big of a deal, but the economics of proof of work mean that people will find it worthwhile to hash at these higher and higher powers in order to capture the mining rewards. And the amount they're willing to spend becomes a fraction of the value of the chain that's being rewarded to them. And so as the coin becomes more and more valuable, and you can see the disaster scenario, the crypto anarchist purists believe that we're eventually going to kind of switch from the monetary systems that everybody has used and the banking systems we've all used and eventually the crypto space will sort of track and hold all of the value of mankind, which will be in the hundreds of trillions of dollars. And at that point, it's almost like uh, it's almost like a Douglas Adams kind of funny thing where we would potentially be spending 80 or 90 percent of the energy in the world just running these chains and running proof of work hashes. 
So there's no sort of way out of that in the proof of work side. That's you know the the sort of fear of going with that. Proof of stake is a very elegant solution to it because in proof of stake, instead of having a crypto economic reward by luckily every once in a while mining a hash, just meaning you do a hash and it happens to give you exactly the right kind of number of zeros and you know combination of digits that you're able to um, show that this is a valid block and it's extremely unlikely, um, but you know you do that. In proof of stake, um, you're instead putting in value that you have on the chain. So you actually are staking your Ethereum and that gives you the right to earn some rewards. It does not take very much computation power to run that. In fact, you know, the design goal for Ethereum 2 on that was to be so environmentally conscious that you could run, at this point, it's way more than one validator. I've heard of people running eight or a dozen validators on a single Raspberry Pi. So you can have a little piece of hardware that, you know, just has, you know, lots of energy computation cost on them, very low bandwidth, very low hardware footprint. And yet they're staking and earning amounts of money that can be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it pretty much removes the computational component that proof of work used. And, you know, obviously for Bitcoin and early blockchains, it was a huge innovation to figure out there was a proof of something that could not be gameable by humans. And the argument and the difficulty with proof of stake is that there are many ways that you can defeat it. You can attack the protocol and you can kind of collude. You can, you know, there's always these little devils with, you know, red horns sticking up in them whenever you do protocol diagrams. And proof of stake, there's just, you know, dozens of different actors that can come in and attack the protocol. So proof of stake, in my view, is actually a large degree. It's a triumph of cryptography mixed with crypto economics that can be made to work. And it's it's quite delicate, as evidenced by the fact that, you know, the team at Ethereum and other places we've been working on it. It's a very difficult thing to get right. So, so actually, we'll get into the mechanics of it in just a second. Um, I did want to first. Uh, uh, go down a slightly different track, which is, um, first of all, so it sounds like after the merge, people are not going to be able to complain about the environmental impact of Ethereum, right? I mean, after the merge, supposedly the huge ener energy costs to go with proof of work will be greatly reduced because proof of stake is so much more energy friendly. Yeah, I would say after the merge, I would sort of say if people are complaining about the energy consumption of Ethereum, they should look at the energy consumption of social media. They should look at that point at the energy consumption of the regular banking system. It's really not that different. I mean, the Ethereum Foundation uses numbers like 99.99% reduction. Um, I'm not sure if it's quite that much because there still is duplication of computation and some other things that are going on that are less efficient than they could be. Um, so there's, you know, still more progress that can be made by doing things like zero knowledge, succinct computations that can wrap things up even more, but it really is a huge, huge improvement. That's right. Yeah. So, so you, you, so basically you become comparable to the energy usage of, you know, social, as you say, but the bank, regular banking system, social networks and so on, mm -hmm. which are, which are acceptable. So this brings us to the next question, which is basically, you know, people have invested, you know, millions and ten, tens of millions of dollars in buying ASICs and GPUs and mm -hmm. what's going to happen, basically, September, come, come the merge in early September, basically all this equipment, what's going to happen to it? So people who bought ASICs, people who bought GPUs, what are they going to do with all this equipment? Yeah, I mean, it's an exciting question. Um, there are obviously a lot of people kind of looking at it. One of the, you know, valuable things that people have pointed out that you can do with them is, you know, there are these desires, um, Outside of the kind of blockchain smart contract space, there's the desire to actually have decentralized computational services out there that are managed, you know, by by blockchain protocols. So there's a protocol like LivePeer out there that allows you to do video compression, decompression, uh, to have sort of decentralized Zoom, decentralized social media systems and others. And, you know, things like those GPUs will probably get gobbled up into those protocols. There's vast amounts of video, other compression. Um, I would say probably the way to think about it is the GPUs can start going back to doing things that are actually useful computation. Uh, there are some places like in certain parts of zero knowledge protocols, the multi-scalar multiplications can effectively use GPUs. So there are some computational efficiencies you can get there. But, you know, definitely for some people, I mean, this is part of the thing in the preparation in Ethereum. They've been saying for a long time to the miners, 
like maybe don't keep buying more mining hardware just for this purpose. The tough part was that Ethereum just went through one of these very high kind of peaks. And when it gets up to these peaks, when it was up at four or 5,000 last year, it was profitable to mine and people were seeing return on investments in three, four months. So people kept buying GPUs. And so Dan, you're right. There are a lot of GPUs that are going to flood the market. It's, you know, probably it's, uh, you know, maybe not the best moment for Nvidia, but it's okay. These, these bumps happen in terms of having too much supply around sometimes. But, but, but I, I kind of, I want to get to the bottom of this. So a lot of people also, you know, bought uh, ASICs, like dedicated equipment just to mine Ethereum. It's not good for anything else. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen to this equipment? That equipment, I mean, there are, you know, there are SHA-3 chains that you can run that um, you can get some minor amount of value. Um, and so there's a possibility on that. There were only a few companies that really went far. I don't think that the hash footprint for Ethereum, I, I, I you could correct me if I don't know the exact, because I don't know the exact number. But I don't think it became an appreciable percentage of the total hash rate just because the GPUs are so much more popular. And luckily, if you want to say it, we ran into chip shortages in the last two, three years. So it wasn't possible to that to run that many TSMC chip starts. But yeah, no, if you if you went out, I think there were some people who are selling these forty, fifty thousand dollar, even hundred thousand dollar mega servers that use specially specialized ASICs. They were very special. They actually weren't compute special. They were like arrays of chips that had very high performance certies. So they were essentially like distributed SRAM memories that allowed you to do very fast manipulation through the DAG of Ethereum. So it was actually not the hashing that was the most important. It was the memory footprint that was the big part. Yeah. But, you know, definitely valid architecture, but not valid economics anymore. Yeah. So uh, what's interesting, actually, it's also related to a question in the chat that, that uh, fine, the ASICs probably will go mine elsewhere. Somebody was suggesting Monero or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, the GPUs are going to be probably going to, as you say, maybe they'll, go, they'll be put to use on video applications. But it seems like a lot of them will actually be put to use on, um, on what we might, might call uh, uh, proof generation, right? So yeah. for rollups and such. Maybe we'll come back to rollups in the future of Ethereum um, in just a few minutes. But the question I have for you, just in that context, is if all we did is we moved the GPUs from finding hash proofs to generating uh, zero knowledge proofs for uh, for scalability, did we really reduce the footprint of Ethereum? Oh yeah, totally. Because zero knowledge proofs are wonderful, right? I mean, zero knowledge proofs you get one person or you have a small committee of load balance zero knowledge provers that you ask to generate this super hard complex computation. And then everybody who's out there verifies these computations in a few or maybe a few tens of milliseconds. So this is one of the beautiful stories of cryptography mixed together with error correcting codes with computational integrity is this whole zero knowledge field where in theory you could compress not just minutes or hours of computation into milliseconds. I mean, the mathematics says that the scaling doesn't end. You could actually compress weeks and months of computation into a little 10 millisecond proof. Yeah, we'll come back to this actually because I think it is important uh, to, to to just discuss briefly how uh, the scalability solution will work uh, will work post merge. So we'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, but let, let, let's uh, just explore kind of the world post merge. So there were two issues with the existing Ethereum. Run one was the complaint about the environmental impact, and that's mm -hmm. going to be solved by proof of stake. And then I want to ask about sort of the just uh, maybe you can explain the impact of 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 the merge on the gas fees on Ethereum? Is it gonna have any impact on gas fees and on the trans and on the TPS rate, transactions per second rate of, of Ethereum? So this is one thing that um, what, what I think sometimes you'll see people write articles and others and they get kind of sloppy talking about it. The at the merge, you know, when the merge happens, there will be no fundamental change to either the transaction per second rate of the VM or the cost of gas fees. The gas fee market right now is a completely open worldwide market. It was improved by this particular protocol that allowed the gas fees to have kind of this control loop that made the gas fees kind of average out over time and slowly increase and decrease depending on how big the demand pool is compared to the actual- You're talking uh, about 1559. 1559, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. 
um, and uh, introduces burn fees, which was like a very interesting financial mechanism. But you know, the if I would say the when people talk about the merge as being a scalability story for Ethereum, I I say that that is still correct, but it's you have to squint out a little bit, bit. The two things are one is that from point of view of the protocol effort going on for the last six, nine months, things have really kind of slowed down on trying to do other things around Ethereum because the whole goal was to get to a successful merge. And it really, I mean, I can't overemphasize how hard everybody in the space has worked on that. I mean, we went a couple of years back and it was sort of like continually hoping that the merge would be possible to get to in six or eight months. And every three months, it would get reset out to six, eight months. And over time, it sort of dropped down to shorter time frames and shorter slips. And you can sort of see if, if it ends up being the last slip that we have, the last sort of decision to do a slip was mid-July. There was a decision to slip it from mid-August to mid-September. And currently, that's still holding. But I would not, I mean, I would not say it's 100% certain that it won't take another slip. I mean, the the core dev team at Ethereum has not accelerated or rushed. They have this very long-term view that the goal of Ethereum is to work in 20 years, not in the next you know, two months or 20 days. And so if they need to slip it another 30 days or 60 days because they detect any kind of instability, they really don't want the merge to cause the financial DeFi markets around Ethereum to see some kind of downtime. It's sort I mean, of uh, yeah. Well, but what's at stake here is unimaginable, unimaginable, right? I mean, you can't. We cannot afford. We cannot afford any screw up with this, uh, with this uh, merge. So this is yeah. important to take their time. Um, yeah, especially I mean, since, said, way, especially since some, some attacks have been discovered in the last couple of months. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Some of there have been some really good work done. Actually, at Stanford, Professor uh, David C. and a number of his grad students and some collaborators have found some really stunning, very tricky balancing attack, timing attack approaches that, you know, you would have thought in the past, I mean, it's just, it's, this is the beautiful thing about protocol design is that, you know, it really is this sort of, you know, two team view of you have people who are trying to create something unbreakable and then another public team that tries to break it. And the more that the public teams try to break it and find those faults, the better it is. But, you know, Ethereum has had to go through a number of uh, changes in order and to- It is important it. to do that before before the thing actually gets deployed. Uh, yeah. So this is why things are, no, no, this is, I think it's very important that this is not rushed, that it's going slowly, and we want to make sure it's successful when it's actually happened. So it's perfectly fine that uh, they're taking their time. Um, yeah, so I think this is kind of the setup for like what the merge is, is about. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit, I want us to talk a little bit about kind of how Ethereum will actually work post-merge. Mm -hmm. So can you describe a little bit of the mechanics of um, like how will things work? What will the validators do? Um, what is what is the staking that's involved? Uh, you know, how will validators make be, be paid for their, for their effort and so on? Yeah, it's this very, uh, it's this, you know, very nice sort of interlocking set of mechanisms. The core, the core participant in the whole system, it has been for a while on the beacon chain, um, but now it's going to be the actual people running the, the, you know, the EVM chain as well, are these people called um, validators. And to become a validator on Ethereum, you have to do something which, you know, at the time they picked this number, it wasn't quite that much money. It was maybe around $6,000. You have to stake 32 ETH. And at layer one, there's no variability on it. You know, if you need to stake 32 ETH in order to be, you know, a validator and get the, that credit for it. And uh, the reason you always say people saying, oh, a validator is 32 ETH and no more. In reality, you can actually stake whatever you want. The only thing is the credit and the reward you get is only based on that hitting the 32 threshold. So in practice, if you have 64 ETH, you're not going to put it all into one validator. You're going to put it on two different validators. That way you get, you know, the reward commensurate for each 32. So that's that's one point. And those Once you're a validator, are, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Those funds are, uh, at least um, naively, those funds are locked. Those funds have been locked. Those right after the merge, the funds are still locked. Once you put them in for the staking on the deposit, there's a special contract on the EVM where you deposit your 32 ETH. They on the Ethereum chain, they get uh, locked or burned, if you want to call it. Um, so you're not going to be able to get them back out of it. 
And then um, that then on the Ethereum 2 beacon chain allows you to then have those ETH minted. And then you start, you know, on the beacon chain doing the operations of that validator. And so the, you know, the, the things that you have to do as a validator that are very important is one is every once in a while, your number randomly gets, you know, picked up and you get put into the group or you get pick, put into a slot where you are going to be the person who will have to propose the block that everybody in the network is going to recognize as that particular block height of Ethereum. And, um, if you don't do this, it's not like you get a massive penalty. Um, you will not get the reward that you want. And if you post a block that's empty, um, it's not like anyone is going to kill you for doing that either. You're obviously wasting space in the chain. Um, but you can post empty blocks. If you look at Ethereum, those come up all the time. Um, but you know, you're incentivized because you do get some additional fees for posting transactions. Most people try to fill up the blocks as much as they can when their chance comes up to maximize their economic returns. And then you distribute. Your job as the person who uh, has this block is that who made this block. You have to make sure that it's valid and then you have to sign it and send it off to everyone. And of course, if you sign and send a block that's invalid, doesn't follow the protocol, then you're gonna get slashed, meaning that you know, you're going to actually lose some of the funds that you've put down. Then everybody else who sees the block from you is going to look at the block that you proposed and they're going to vote on is it valid and you know is this the um, canonical chain that they would like to um, have go forward and you know you can have differences in the voting because when you mint your block you have to point back somewhere and say where you're minting it from and you may point back to a block that you know is uh, a different location and so you may actually um, people may have to choose whether to go one direction or the other if there's disagreement as the blocks are being produced and as validator you have a couple of you know somewhat interesting considerations that if you don't vote at all you slowly get penalized if you do vote and then you change a vote it's called equivocating you get slashed a ton for doing that and um, just for validating, most of the rewards that you make as a validator in Ethereum is just for paying attention to the blocks that are coming out from people and then voting correctly on which ones look to you like they're going to be the finalized chain. But, but, but I want to get a little deeper into this because uh, a, you, you mentioned the slashing mechanism that, like for, for example, if you happen to vote in two different ways uh, on a block, then you get slashed quite heavily, yeah? Yeah. But re realistically, when you think about uh, these, this is just humans operating these validators, right? So suppose a, a validator voted. When you say votes, when you say vote, you mean the validator generates a signature, yeah, and That's right. propagated to the network. So uh, imagine a validator votes, then the validator crashes. It's a machine, right? So it could just crash. Mm -hmm. The operator brings up the machine, and the machine says, "Oh yeah, I haven't voted. I need to vote." So it votes again, and maybe mm -hmm. it votes differently. So boom, mm -hmm. now because of uh, a new machine crashed, you ended up voting in two different ways and you get slashed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. what happens then? What do we do? I mean, you know, you, you, you weren't dishonest. You just happened to have your machine crash on you. So what do we do in that case? And actually, I'm, I'm, this is a leading question because I wanted, to, I wanted you to talk a little about maybe a little bit about uh, DVT, decentralized validation technology or distributed mm -hmm. validation technology. And maybe oh, yeah, yeah. No, this is a great lead in topic that, you know, one of the problems is that um, if you're a validator and if you have if you have to worry about your hardware breaking on you, then you have to spend a lot more money and you have to spend a lot more kind of effort on maintaining and making sure that your hardware and your software run correctly. And, you know, one of the goals of Ethereum has always been to make it very easy to lower the bar so that sort of anybody who wants to contribute they don't have to be running in the best data center in the world. In fact, preferably you'd be able to have people running in some of the you know, darkest, strangest places in the world because the idea is that it's more decentralized if governments don't know where you know, to find all of these validators that are out there and so forth. So the goal is to make it very, very simple to do this. So there is on the roadmap of protocol technologies that are going to be coming post-merge, one of them is this um, uh, technology of a distributed validator where you and a pool of people can come together and as long as a threshold of you vote correctly, then 
your vote will be registered as correct. So you can actually have missing hardware, you can have faulty hardware, and as long as the people you've teamed up with are working correctly, then you'll get it. And that's pretty amazing when you think about it, because you know uh, the idea of computer science and electrical engineering a lot of times is you know having these very centralized controls where the person who's running a high reliability system has to own all of the parts. And this is very nice now that there's a cryptography protocol. It's you know still not ready for prime time. People are still working on it, but it's very much in the roadmap and it's known that it's going to be one of the upgrades over time for Ethereum is this uh, this improvement. And that will you know just dramatically improve the ability for regular people who want to just run their own validators. So presum presumably it, um, in some sense, it's safe, it would be safer to run a validator because you're not so much at risk even if your machine crashes because you're part of a larger a larger crowd is that yeah yeah exactly and even if you're running a validator yourself i mean you can just use that protocol itself as your ras service you can run three validators and do a two out of three but even better you can do five out of seven with you know some of your friends or you can sign up there's there's a number of technology i think obel networks is one of them that they're they're basically not going to launch until this protocol comes out and when it does launch, you just sign up with a validator and they help you to find the people that you get assigned to and they move you around. So you don't, it's like a distributed validator pool. They move you around to where you need to go. And in terms of running a validator, like if I wanted to run a validator, would, again, just I want to make sure we're, we're getting the right message across. So are, would I be run, running a validator on my, on my laptop? Would I be running a validator by, you know, running, you know, buying some, uh, renting a cage somewhere and running my own machines in the cage? Or would I be running a validator by running it at AWS and have Amazon manage it for me? I mean, the answer is sort of yes, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> because you can run a validator anywhere. Um, there's the question of the sort of uptime. If you're running on a laptop and if you have any kind of interruptions that are going on where your validator might pause, it is very important that you have some process elsewhere in the world that would take your validator out of the active pool. Because while your validator is in the active pool and it doesn't vote, if it consecutively doesn't vote for a long time, it starts getting slushed pretty hard, harshly. And that's not something the protocol can remove because there's this important point that you know people who do distributed systems know, which is that you can't have sort of safety and liveness, multiple of these protocols all together at the same time. And the way that Ethereum handles that is that, you know, it gets the safety and liveness by the fact that you know it has this very you know good safety property but the liveness can get thwarted if a lot of validators go offline simultaneously so in order for the protocol to not have a huge pause waiting for people to come back it has this sort of capacitor draining property that if a lot of people go offline the protocol will start slashing them so that it effectively kicks out their stake which makes them not just be, get kicked out of the network, but it actually causes them to lose real money, you know, if you consider crypto to be real money. So it causes them to lose the value of the crypto that they had staked in their hold. And then the protocol can get itself back to a point where it can achieve liveness, meaning that two thirds of the remaining people who are online are able to commit to a final vote. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, a, that's super interesting. Uh, so actually, we're getting close to where the time when I need to where we need to stop, but uh, and ask for questions. But it, there is, I'm, I'm going to take four more minutes because there is something that we have we do need to discuss. So we did say that um, um, you know transactions per second and gas fees are not going to quite change when the merge happens. And so I wanted to just talk a little bit about what are the plans post merge for improving uh, TPS and reducing gas gas fees. So maybe you can talk a little bit about the verge and the purge and the splurge and kind of the, the next the next steps that come after the merge. Yeah, I mean, for anybody who wants to see it, if you haven't, there's, you know, there's a great after this, you know, the terms, all the ones uh, Dan is talking about here uh, have been laid out a couple of times by Vitalik. And he went through a nice talk at ETCC at Paris um, a couple of weeks back now. And he went through that progress as well. Um, the most important piece of scaling that Ethereum is expecting to leverage um, as soon as possible is to give all of the rollups that are, you know, these layer two structures. And, you know, they're this very important thing. They're not a separate blockchain. They sort of run their own chain, but they leverage and pay for the economic security of layer one. 
So even though you're running transactions on these, you know, as their protocols get filled out, they eventually give you the same kind of protocol guarantees that you get out of running at layer one, just at a much higher transaction per second rate and at a much lower cost. And the main cost that remains for rollups is this issue of you need to make sure that the data that is necessary to follow the rollups chain in order to know what its current state is and to post new transactions has to be available somewhere. Right now, the safest, most secure way of doing that is by posting that data on Ethereum. Ethereum has this idea of call data. You can just put a blob of data in your transactions. So the rollups just post data. And um, in order to get that cost to be lower, you know, the, the challenge always for Ethereum is to keep this hardware footprint very low. So Ethereum has been very remiss to go to like very high multi-threaded processors to go to hundreds of gigabytes of memory footprint. It's really wanted the validators to be as small as possible. So the actual memory bandwidth that Ethereum has allowed and the amount of computation it allows per block has been kept very small so that these validators can be quite tiny and it's attempted and it looks to me like it is, you know, will succeed definitely to achieve the scaling through kind of a parallelization enabled by crypto cryptography and crypto economics. And so after the, the, the merge, um, you know, the, the thing that we're going to do first is going to be the splurge and the splurge is going to be, um, it's, uh, um, it's, it's also referred to as donk sharding after one of the ETH researchers. And in there, there's a protocol for doing an erasure coding of a block of data. And the beautiful, you know, sort of achievement that you get out of it is as a validator, looking at it, only a small portion of the data goes through, you can vote for whether or not the data all appeared to be present. Everybody else can vote for whether they thought the data was all present or not. The entire collection of everybody looking at Ethereum, no single person has to actually see all of the data and have it flow through their one hardware node and yet the security property is that you have extremely high probabilistic guarantee that with the vote being up you know above the threshold 51 percent of the validator seeing the data that it would be astronomically impossible for someone to have withhold held a single byte of that data once we have that protocol in then we'll be able to do this thing called data sharding allowing us to open up tremendously the amount of data at layer one and so the splurge is both the final roadmap of that and there's an intermediate step called like mini dunk sharding which is the mini first step of the the surge where the block space will be opened up by about a factor of eight or ten or so and so we'll already see you know a large drop in the price of rollups which at the moment is not very important because the price on ethereum is like three way you can do transactions at a very cheap price but if there's another crypto run up and space is uh extremely uh, uh, limited, like we had before, people were spending hundreds of dollars to mint an NFT at L1 and became really impractical. So that's going to have to move to these rollups. So the scalability solutions basically is something that's planned in the next phases post uh, po post merge. I do want to yeah. quote actually. There's a there's a, a a quote that I like from uh, Justin Drake. Actually, it was one of the Ethereum Foundation researchers, um, where basically he says there's like uh, three factors of a hundred in the performance of Ethereum mm -hmm. that's gonna be gained. One factor of 100 comes from rollups, another factor of 100 comes from uh, sharding, and another factor of 100 comes from just hardware uh, and networking improvements, which overall could, could, could give us a, a factor of a million uh, improvement in uh, the transaction rate for, for Ethereum. And his point is actually kind of interesting because of those transaction rates, you know, that's kind of enough for the entire planet. So um, in some sense, there's a long roadmap here to scale Ethereum to, uh, to to actually be able to support every uh, every person on Earth issuing transactions, which I, th I thought is pretty is pretty interesting way of of kind of describing the long term plans. Yeah. Uh, so so let's see. So we we are at time here. So I do want to give time for folks to ask questions. So if anybody wants to go ahead and unmute themselves and just ask a question, uh, or if you're uh, shy, you can ask a question in the chat, and I'll I'll repeat your question for you. So uh, yeah, please please go ahead. Um, and if nobody asks questions, then I'll ask questions. Oh, uh, yeah, Hi. please go ahead. Hi, Dr. Drost. Hi, Professor Bonet. Thanks for making the time. Um, question around like the true like decentralization of ETH and what the merge means for that. Because I feel like a lot of 
managed node providers and folks like that have this like, you know, first, like philosophically, they control a lot of the nodes and stuff like that. Um, but more like practically, uh, if there's any downtime with them, just the concentration of nodes with them is like a problem. Uh, how do you see the merge really affecting it practically in terms of uh, just proliferation of nodes and, and validators? Yeah, I, that's a great question. That was actually, I gave a talk, not this year, at the previous year's ECC specifically about whether or not we were going to just see effectively concentration because of the convenience factors, not even like it's more, not that it's more efficient, it's not you make more money, but it's just easier to go into some of these larger pools. I mean, the, the, the sort of the, um, the point of decentralization is that you do get a mix of different types of people that are in the system. So um, even if you have, you know, uh, 10,000 different people all running validator nodes, but they all are running them on AWS and they all end up happening to run them in the Ohio data center, then that's not great for decentralization in a physical sense. Um, I think, you know, the reality for whether it's proof of work or proof of stake is that there just end up being human dynamic factors that prevent the decentralization from being able to achieve. I think Vitalik kind of refers to it sometimes of like, it would be great if we could actually have the mechanisms be anti-collusion. If you could prove that you really are working independent from everyone else, you should get a bonus for doing that. And unfortunately, there's all sorts of effort that's ongoing about proof of humanity and other things. I mean, if you really could prove that, you know, you would get a credit for running your first validator, then, you know, you could actually push out this kind of an idea, but there are these civil attacks and it's really hard to know in a, cryptography space, uh, you know, who, whose people's true identities are. So um, in proof of stake, I would say that we have a number of mechanisms that can kind of push culturally and as, a, uh, as an environment towards people trying to not centralize too much. Um, but there's always going to be a little bit of this tension where people are upset that maybe there's too much of the staking being handled through a Coinbase or through a Lido or through one of these other mechanisms. I did make a point at my talk last year at ETCC that if you look at the mechanism of running validators and so forth, that you know, for businesses like Coinbase or some of the others, it's not necessarily that much in their interest. They make so much more funds in a lot of cases just by running, you know, managing running users' funds by kind of front running their own customers' transactions, the way that companies like Robinhood make money and offer free trading that um, in a lot of cases, they actually are gonna be more than happy to leverage, even though you're centralizing with them, you may actually be running on top of independent stakers underneath who are going through protocols like Lido or Rockapool or so forth. The main point I think in decentralization is to just try to have a lot of different approaches, um, you know, seven or eight or nine of them at each different possible layer uh, so that there's enough anti-fragility that if some of them go away in a coordinated fashion that the others can take over. And like we said before, on the liveness side, keep in mind that Ethereum is robust, that if you had 95% of the network disappear because all of, let's say, there was a cease and desist order and all of the three major cloud providers had to stop running crypto nodes. Right now, I think AWS, last time I heard is, I don't know, that was probably six months ago, last time I checked, but AWS was running, I think, over 70% of the validators on ETH2. You could trace back to running inside of AWS. So you would see a momentary stop in Ethereum's uh, beacon chain if 70% of the validators went away, but it wouldn't actually go on for that long because the liveness capacitor would very quickly either slash and kick them all out, or those people would have bots running somewhere else in the world as a fail safe that would withdraw themselves from the validating pool in order to save their funds. And Ethereum would go on with one third or 30% of the size of the validator pool. So the size can be dynamically adjusted if there is a concentration risk. And in that sense, proof of stake is actually more robust than proof of work. Yeah, very interesting. Yixiong, you want to you wanna, uh, ask your question? Uh, hi. Hi, Robert. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, uh, what's your take on the rumored uh, proof of work fork? Uh, started by some individuals in the community and uh, like from your perspective what's your 
what's their motivation and uh, what's the potential consequences of those um, initiatives? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, each person will probably have their own motivation. A very clear motivation is, you know, as uh, Professor Bonet was saying, yeah, if you've bought expensive mining equipment that's only able to do SHA-3 hashing, and then you certainly have an economic reason to do it. Even if you have GPUs, it's easier to keep mining if it's still giving rewards. So I think a fair number of people may actually keep mining for a while in order to just sort of test out the waters and see what happens. There are some people who probably do feel like proof of work is just a um, more robust mechanism. There have been talks from some of the EF researchers where they talk with people about proof of work. And in some ways, you can look at it from a mathematical view. And the other side, there's a bit of mysticism with you know, Nakamoto not being even known who they are. And it's sort of like this was handled, handed down on some stone tablets from above. So we have this idea of how to run blockchains and we shouldn't really necessarily change that. Um, so, but I think overall in Ethereum, that's kind of the subset. The people who generally feel that way are on Bitcoin already and they're not going to leave Bitcoin. So I think the, the bigger motivation is probably the one of people just sort of not wanting to give up on, on proof of work. And maybe there are some people who think that proof of uh, stake may crash and burn. I mean, uh, Dan Binet pointed out there were some, you know, serious, I mean, unexpected from a year ago, you know, findings of possible balancing attacks, especially around the sort of uh, epoch boundaries on Ethereum. There's anytime you have a protocol and it has a little knobby edge to it, there's a little attack sort of surface on these edges and boundary conditions. You always see that in engineering. So they end up being some tricky things. So it's there's some possibility that proof of stake could still run into problems. It's very small at this point, but you know, some people may feel like they should keep running for that reason as well. Yeah, very interesting. So you, your prediction is that the two chains will actually run in parallel to one another for a while. Yeah, I think they will. The proof of work chain will have to do something, which is it can't run that long before there's this thing called the ice age bomb. And all that that means is that normally the difficulty for the next block is set based on how long it took for the last block to be generated. And so that sort of sets the block at this, you know, average 12 to 15 second period between blocks. At, there's an additional factor in that equation that at a certain point you get this exponential increase in difficulty regardless of the amount of time. And it's called an ice age because the blocks will start being minted in 20 seconds, 30 seconds, multiple minutes. And so it'll just slow down. So for a while, it could go on without any change. After that, people who would be running ETHW would have to coordinate and decide to remove this one line of code. Um, so conceivably, they would do that. But ultimately, the biggest thing on whether you know that looks viable or not is, you know, would there be uh, value in running it? And then as we've seen in other ones, when ETH Classic forked off, there was really strong opinions at that point. There were a lot of people who felt that the DAO hack should not have been reversed because they felt that code was law. And so uh, there were real developers who went with the ETH Classic community and were doing active development on it. Right now, I don't know of, I really don't know of any core development person on the software side who's planning on working on that fork. They're all planning on working on the proof of stake side. So. That's probably the biggest factor. I mean, the, the thing about blockchains that I think make them one of the better forms of governance for populations is that there is the ability to sort of leave. And so you can fork and exit and leave, but if you fork and exit and leave society as a single person, it's not that interesting. You gotta kind of <laughs> leave with people. And so, you know, people can fork, but that doesn't mean it's gonna mean anything significant. Yeah, that's, a, that's a really good point, yeah. Max, I wanna give you time to ask your question. Yeah, so thanks for talking to us. Um, my question was about the security implications of ETH2. So you've kind of touched on the decentralization aspect, but um, you know, once this merge goes through, what do you anticipate the implications will be for um, ETH's like, security, right? Um, do you anticipate any, kind of in a similar vein, do you anticipate any synergies between you know, the technologies after the merge and uh, ZK EVM technologies? Or do you think those are just going to be um, kind of very independent. Oh, those are two great questions. Um, for security, let me actually say, because security is one of these words like trust, 
that it can mean so many different things. When you talk about, I'll, I'll say security, if we define in the computer science sense, security is expressing the immutability or certainty that you can have that information has that has already been posted on the chain will not revert and get rewritten in another form. So it's the security that you're not going to have the chance of these double spend attacks or like double identity transfers or those types of things. The original you know, reason to even have blockchains was this idea of security of the database that it's finalized in some sense. In that sense, the security of proof of stake ends up being um, very, very much better and quite different in nature from the security of proof of work. Proof of work is a protocol where you can incentivize people to do the right thing but if they do the wrong thing, you can't penalize them because you don't know who they are. As long as somebody mints a winning, um, a winning block, they can post it and they can sit behind VPNs and tours and other things, and you just could never know who that person was. And so you could have people doing these sort of long range attacks and other stuff of proof of work chains. And yes, they're spending money in order to be mining a hash rate at you know 51% you know, or at a faster rate than the majority chain and then coming out and subverting and sort of destroying the security of, you know, tens or hundreds of blocks by, you know, rewriting them in a new order and with new transactions and new state. Um, but you can't go ahead and slash them. And uh, furthermore, in proof of work, it's very dangerous that if you successfully attack proof of work, the cost is nothing because you actually get all of the rewards since the entire chain is moved over to you and it's a fate accompli that everybody else is forced to go to your chain because you've made the longest train chain. Proof of security is much better in two senses in that attacking the chain is noticeable and causes you to get your stake slashed. And it is in theory, when people say proof of stake has absolute security, they're not actually saying it's impossible to go back on what's been posted. What they're saying is that there is an actual economic cost. You cannot subvert the chain and then cause it to go to another path without having a lot of economic value destroyed. So once you've gone into the 67% threshold, which is the proof of stake threshold for Ethereum to finalize a given block, the only way to rewrite the history at that point is that half of that 67% or 33% of them have to switch their votes. And as we said before, when you switch your vote, you get slashed really heavily. You get this, you know, equivocation uh, slashing. And, you know, the saying that was said early on that really is quite accurate is as if you went into your like Bitcoin or Ethereum proof of work mining farm and you just blew it up or burned it down because all of that value is gone. All of your hardware is gone. You can't bring it up again because the stake has been burned on the new chain that you've successfully done the revert. So. In that sense, I would say that proof of stake, I mean, there's a lot of other attacks that you can have on it, but from a raw economic security perspective, proof of stake handily wins over proof of work. Actually, yeah, related to this, Vishal actually has a question here on um, whether whether it validators make more revenue using proof Ethereum proof of work, or do they make more revenue using Ethereum proof of stake? That is, once the merge happens, what's the impact on valid on, on minor validator revenue? So um, it depends, you know, this is now getting to a point you have to say to yourself, well, some people may be making more, some people may be making less. Um, overall, probably there's, we know there's a much lower issuance rate happening. So the inflation for the Ethereum chain, you know, the amount of funds that are paid out to validators to do the right thing and to continue operating the chain is dropping by, I think, about a factor of 10. Um, and, um, uh, and so um, the, the, the thing that um, the main thing is that on the proof of work chain, you can look at the rewards and you can say that it's a large amount of rewards that are actually being um, given out to people. But then you have to look at what was the carried operational costs. People had to buy the GPUs. They had to buy data centers. They had to pay overhead for data center costs. They have to pay the energy and the operating costs of running those data centers. And, you know, for a lot of people running, I mean, you know, if things are going well, your cost of goods may be one half or lower. So, you know, when you make $100, you actually are putting 50 in your pocket, the other you're paying to providers. That's the whole reason for the economic cost. The reason you're burning energy and doing all these bad things with proof of work is that you're having to spend money to do it. Um, so, so there's that factor in proof of stake. 
there's, you know, the operational cost has been brought down to, you know, uh, by that 99 plus percent. So whatever you're seeing as the reward really is economic reward that's going to people. It's not going to pay large amounts of money. It's in fact, when you look at things like Amazon Web Services, it's almost a little crazy to run something like a validator in Amazon Web Services because it's a constant computation load. And Amazon is not great for that. In reality, if you're running your own if you're running your own computation load and you're running your own hardware, you can do about a factor of 10 better than Amazon. But most people don't care because the cost of goods of running a validator for Ethereum 2 with proof of stake are so low that the convenience is more important than the cost of running it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, and I actually correct something I just said, because I realized I said the statement about 10 times lower issuance rate. That's not actually correct. They, the issuance rate is lower than it was previously, but the bigger factor, the reason why it does make such a dramatic difference is there's this burn fee factor that actually negates almost all of the issuance rate that's happening. And so you end up seeing the effective issuance that's happening or the inflation on Ethereum gets either very small or it's believed that it's a high likelihood that you know uh, it will go negative and Ethereum will actually start becoming a deflationary coin. Which could also happen today with 1559. Uh, as well. Yeah, exactly. It, it still happens today some days, but the amount of uh, funds that are put out in proof of work mining, um, you know, surpass that. Uh, only they've not surpassed it on certain days. If you had some new NFT dropping and there were some big gas price auctions, you'd have, you know, net gas burn days in the past so, year. So we, we actually have until we have 10 more minutes. We have until 615. So if anybody has more questions, that'd be great. Otherwise, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask some questions. Um, so feel free to put them in the chat or uh, or speak up. Um, I was going to ask you about uh, the 32 ETH that needs to be locked up, right? So 32 ETH is a fair amount of money these days. And it might not, it might be kind of difficult for people to just put up that much stake and become validators on their own. So of course, what happened is the next thing that happened is people pool their pe people pool the stake together, and you have services like Lido that allow people to basically participate in validation without actually putting all these funds in. Mm -hmm. but in some sense, thirty-two ETH was ne needed. Uh, there's some security reason why why you need a you know a relatively large stake, and now it's possible to become validated with with much less stake as a result. So can you talk a little bit about like how do you view services like Lido? What are their implications to the security of proof of stake and mm -hmm. generally kind of to, to the economics of proof of stakes overall? Yeah, I mean, this is important um, because we've definitely seen with things like there's, you know, this huge centralization risk we saw with US Terra and then Three Arrows and Celsius and some of these centralized um, DeFi protocol or DeFi systems that were out there that really caused a lot of grief in the crypto world because they got into bad positions and when things went wrong it caused the problem there's definitely you know concern with some of these that you know you could have a lot of people that are you know putting funds into some of these protocols and then you end up with um uh you know you end up with some centralization as well i think I guess actually your question was more along the lines of first of all as a person who has let's say a tenth of an eth or one or two eth the, the reason these services have sprung up is that, you know, there is a marketplace for connecting people who are going to run validation services together with people who have funds to run them. And there are other protocols out there. I think one of the first ones that went out with the nice, you know, early version of proof of stake that had a lot of features uh, was Tezos. That was back even like 2018, uh, going back to the previous cycle of up and down. Um, and uh, after that, I think another protocol, near protocol, a lot of these protocols have done this where you can do staking at layer one and you can delegate your stake to people who run the hardware for you. And um, the, you know, the upside for that is you can get involvement from people at an earlier stage. The downside is that it makes it more likely that the people who do validation have to be more permission. They have to be allowed into the network. Um, there is a difference. There's two staking providers, you know, right now that people talk about. One is Lido and one is Rocket Pool. And Lido is one where Lido picks and works with a set of professional people who run hardware, know how to do staking. And so they sort of make a marketplace of, you know, individual consumers, us, 
who put money into the protocol, and then they have this curated set of people. Rocket Pool is a two-sided marketplace. You can come to Rocket Pool being an independent validator and sign up permissionlessly. And the reason you can do that is the protocol knows that if you screw up, you're going to be burning your own stake. So you have to actually put down your stake in some extra so that Rocket Pool is not the one suffering if you screw up as a validator. And Rocket Pool then gives the other side of the market. So there's different models for how you can do this. Um, I think, you know, I had, I remember talking with some Ethereum researchers early on who were a little disappointed um, seeing that these layer two marketplaces emerged so quickly. They weren't surprised that Coinbase and Gemini and others did, um, did sort of staking as a service because they figured it would be centralized, but they were maybe a little bit more disappointed that staking as a service and delegated staking appeared in Ethereum anyway. I viewed it as a more positive thing that one of the ideas in Ethereum is that you should open up the idea that you can try different systems at a higher layer with different execution, different security guarantees, different performance, different kind of features and characteristics. And by making the layer one in Ethereum very strict that you just have as a validator with Ethereum, you just have this very strict relationship. You just have to deposit your funds. You have a validation signature. You have a withdrawal signature, you know, very simple things that you can interact with. But then at the layer two, you can have a number of different type of staking as a service providers. And we have some now, but, you know, as uh, Dan mentioned, we're even going to have, you know, changes in the future because we'll have these distributed validator technologies and so forth. So it's really one of these, you know, same, same thing that I say, one of the important strengths of a technology like Ethereum is the fact that it has funded and it doesn't just have one canonical code base. It has clients that are running it written in rust written in go you know written in a lot of different c you know c plus plus and other things so you have entirely different implementations and that smooths out the roughness because a bug in one code base won't automatically cause the bug in others and so forth so there's this idea of like in i would say in natural systems and others that you get anti-fragility by having a number of different implementations that are competing mm -hmm. yeah uh, makes sense daniel i see you have your hand up go ahead <clears throat> yeah. Um, hi, Robert. Um, I think you mentioned before that, uh, like in the past, the vision for Ethereum was to switch the virtual machine to use WebAssembly. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems like um, there's not a lot of work on that front. And so with other projects like Near and Polkadot that use WebAssembly as its virtual machine, um, it seems like, um, well, like, is there any work being done on that end to change the execution environment of the smart contracts to switch to something like uh, WebAssembly or something different for ETH 2.0? Not on Ethereum. No, that that there was a thought for a while. Um, seriously, in the beginning, obviously, that was the plan. And then even when it was switched to merging in the EVM, there was the thought that maybe there would be execution shards with different types of execution and so forth. Now the thinking is very strongly that layer one is going to try to calcify over the next five years or so into almost a simpler protocol. They want to take things out and not add new things in. And if you want to have WebAssembly, if you want to have UTXO, simple, you know, uh, uh, simple payment verification systems, if you want to have special EVM, the ZK EVM languages like Cairo or Noir, you can have those just do them in a layer two you can put in you could if you wanted right now you know interesting project launch a layer two on ethereum that runs exactly the solana protocol you can do that as a layer two and you can just put the state routes back in you don't even have to cost a lot of money because you can run data availability separately if your network likes it so you can do that sort of thing and get all of the economic security of ethereum on there run exactly the system you want solana is notable because it allows parallel instruction sorry, parallel transaction execution. So it has a lot of these threads that sort of expand out and converge back. So really the idea of this is that from a maximal decentralized standpoint, you want to make the lower layer as simple as possible. And I say that kind of smiling a little bit because you look at Ethereum and it doesn't look simple, but you know, because there is a lot of mechanics on it, but when you look at other systems and kind of how complex and like how much hardware centralization you have to put in there in order to be able to run something like a Solana node and it keeps increasing, then you see the, you know, the challenge and part of the reason Ethereum has taken a while to kind of get this right is it 
has in a lot of cases had to work with you know people like Dan Binet and others to actually create the cryptography that's possible to make these things happen. Right. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for saying that, Robert. Um, <laughs> true. Uh, Roy, you're up. Thank you, Dan, uh, and thank you, Robert. Uh, it's been tremendous to listen to your sharing. Um, so I have a quick two-part question. First is I've read some articles about sharding leading to very uh, kind of segregated. Uh-oh. Maybe drop your video, Roy, because I think we dropped, we lost audio and video. But I think the question is about sharding. Just the fact, the fact that that sharding might eat, might lead to a degraded degraded performance on the blockchain. And what can we do about that? Is that is that your question, Roy? Um, if some shards will become populated and others will become desolate, is the question. Um, and second part of the question is uh, if layer twos will become customizable. Is there a point like protocols such as Cosmos that's like competing with the same philosophy? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a, you know, it's obviously a different topic than the merge itself, but I'm always happy and I think it's a very interesting topic of what are the reasons for having different protocols and I think you have to look at it, I mean, uh, it's been observed for a while now that like in a sense every layer one can do what every other layer one does. Um, and even if they look like they're doing things differently, they can always copy each other's technologies or, you know, copy in the good sense of you're doing something better than me. I'm going to actually incorporate it in my protocol and do a fork. And you can do that for most everything. I've heard people in the privacy space say, oh, we need to start with a complete layer one. And I always think it's even that you can actually argue that you can get some level of privacy even into Ethereum layer one if you wish. Um, you know, maybe not what's in there already, but you could expand it out to be private or. Um, but so when I look at things like Cosmos and I look at Solana and I look at, you know, um, Polkadot and Near and others, it's more of a question of do they have a different use case? And is their use case offering something that's really unique for their for their their users? Cosmos has this very unique thing in there that it has this inter blockchain communication that if you ascribe to the blockchain, then you're able to do non optimistic, you know, fully deterministic state transfers between the Cosmos chains that you, you know, create. And you're able to create your Cosmos chain and do a lot of things on your, you know, your own. And you can have it in almost, you know, you have a tremendous amount of design flexibility. So in a sense, it's sort of like Cosmos, you know, it obviously predated Ethereum 2 by quite a bit and predated the whole roll-up roll map, as did um, as did Polkadot. And they both were a way to allow you to have people have some level of control over, you know, creating new chains, having some private kind of aspects, having like, you know, authorized validators, these permissionless validators, different consensus systems, but they allowed it to then be tied together into one system. Ethereum with rollups is moving in that direction, but right now the overhead for starting up, you're not seeing you know, we have six or seven different rollups and with the ZK VMs, we're going to have even more of them coming down the line, but it's not going to be anything like the Cosmos system where you've just had so many people use Tendermint to create lots of different chains. So Cosmos, I would say the use case there is that, you know, uh, BFT, the Tendermint, and then being able to use the IBC. Solana, just to give it just, you know, some props there is that having these very sub-second times and having something that looks more like a trading floor in a blockchain, you know, giving up a lot on the decentralization, having a lot of assumptions about the hardware trust and the validators and so forth, but it's a very different use case. And so you see why, you know, people kind of go with it. So that's, you know, to me, it's I mean, it's sort of like, it really is like in social media. I mean, there's, it's not that different. When you look at the fact you can post, you know, all sorts of media on Instagram and Twitter and Snapchat and, Telegram and everything else, like there's a lot of similarities between them, but then you look at what's different about them and then how different we as humans use them. And so that to me is the biggest strength of L1s is do they have a human difference for their network that will draw people to them that are really passionate about what's different for them versus Ethereum or any of the other chains that are out there. So if anybody's entrepreneurial and thinking about doing something different, that's the important one always is how do you capture the hearts and minds of a bunch of zealots in your community? Yeah. So your, your your point of view is that they'll will will forever continue to have lots of lots of options with even layer ones. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a human property, right? That it, it just if you look at it, the existing system 
only has so much upside for people. If you can stake out and do something a little different or new and get a new community around you, if you do it more independent, just as a startup or anything else, you get a lot more personal gain from it. And so humans are entrepreneurial in that sense. So blockchain, I don't think it's ever going to settle into like a winner takes all. Even though I think, you know, there are some definite la lower layer crypto economic securities, like there are people who think Bitcoin should go away. But, you know, Bitcoin does offer something, which is that it's just not going to change its protocol. It's not going to get better. It is, you know, its certainty is that it just won't change. It calcified a long time ago. Ethereum is moving in that way, but it's not moving in that way. As you said, Dan, you know, it's it wanted to get that million X scale improvement, you know, via all of these mechanisms. Layer one's actually not going to get that much faster, right? Layer one's going to, you know, might in improve the execution layer, may actually improve that they increase the TPS in the EVM by some significant amount, but I'd be shocked if it was 100x at layer one, that the scalings are gonna come from other places. So that's that's always gonna be a property of human nature is to build other things. So, you know, Bitcoin will always provide security, Ethereum will provide security, others will as well. And then we'll have even more of this Cambrian explosion of L2s and, and then L3s and systems for, you know, doing everything, virtually everything we do at Web2 will find some way to express itself in a, cleaner, more um, anti-fragile, better privacy, better management of people's identity system using this technologies over time. And that to me, you know, Dan, when you said the thing about a million X, it's like, yes, a million X will handle everything we're doing in the financial system. But now you do have to put on top of that everything else that we do and uh -huh. what of those will want to have improvements and so forth. So, you know, we'll we'll probably find that we'll be straining forever under wanting to get more scale, but that's good. That's why we're going to continue to have students do PhDs and start new companies and so forth. Ah, I like that vision. So this this area is going to stay hot for many 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 years to come. But what a, this is a wonderful way to actually uh, end the conversation. I think we we are we are at, at time. Um, and so Robert, this was this was fantastic. So um, uh, it's wonderful to hear all your insights on the merge, and uh, I think it's been very instructive for everyone. And thanks for thanks for ev answering everyone's questions. This was this was really good. Um, if anybody has any any uh, questions, uh, feel free to you know to email me or uh, Robert. We'd be we'd be more than happy to answer. Absolutely, so, fantastic, Priyanka. You want to uh, finish us off? Um, of course, I don't have anything to say. I think we're over time. So thank you everyone for joining us. And um, yeah, do check us out. And if you have any questions, feel free to email and we'd be happy to help you guys out. Awesome. Thank you and so much. Uh, the everyone at the end of the month.